Hi guys. Solo tonight. <laughs> Hi guys and uh, welcome to the show. Um, so I've got Richard here with me tonight. Um, Daniel is still involved in the show in the background. He's going to be popping in from time to time. Um, we also might have VPA popping in from time to time. Um, I, I've had a discussion with them in the week on chat. But in this show specifically, we wanted to zoom in on more elements of um, the pending regulation and you know what we've read in the bill. And specifically on this show, we want to talk about you know online shopping. Now, if you go through the bill and you go to page 16 and you look at point eight, 8.5, it reads there, no person shall uh, sell, offer, for sale, supply, distribute, or buy any relevant products through the postal service or any other electronic medium by any other remote means. So, I mean, you know, initially when I read that, I thought, okay, um, you know, w what does that mean? You know, and there's a lot actually squashed into one sentence there. So, you know, if, uh, if you read a little bit, if you just slow down a little bit, <clears throat> so you can't buy any relevant product through postal services or any other electronic medium by any other remote means. So I wonder what this is, you know, um, what the what the aim is of this specific point here. Is the is the problem here age verification? Um, yeah, I think we need to look at the broader sort of international environment and landscape from which this flows. Um, all tobacco legislation around the world flows from the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which is a World Health Organization treaty that most countries have signed up to. And what that treaty does is it obliges them to implement various baseline legislative and regulatory measures to combat uh, tobacco harms. South Africa obviously is a signatory to that convention which guides all our anti-tobacco policy. Now, as far as I know, there isn't an equivalent treaty uh, as regards the regulation of e-cigarettes. Nevertheless, nevertheless, um, the World Health Organization has released guidelines, and these were a number of years ago, uh, to help uh, countries develop policies to regulate vaping. The report was published in, in 2013, which makes it very dated now. But as, as they say here, it provides detailed policy suggestions for countries to regulate e-cigarettes, including banning the use of e-cigarettes anywhere that the use of conventional cigarettes is prohibited, Banning the sale of e-cigarettes to anyone who cannot legally buy cigarettes or in any venues where sale of conventional cigarettes is prohibited. Apply the same marketing restrictions to e-cigarettes as are applied to conventional cigarettes. Ban the practice of co-branding e-cigarette products with cigarettes or marketing in a way that promotes dual use. Banning the use of characterizing flavors in e-cigarettes, particularly candy and alcohol flavors. Banning companies from making claims regarding tobacco use cessation until such time when e-cigarette manufacturers and companies provide sufficient evidence that ENDS products can be used effectively for cessation. And prohibiting e-cigarette companies from making health claims about their products unless approved by appropriate regulatory agencies. And then finally calls for the development of standards for regulating product ingredients and functioning. Now, this to me is an interesting uh, point because the minister has made reference to this, to the fact that um, World Health Organization guidelines have been a major determining factor in the department's drafting of these regulations. So in other words, they've taken their lead uh, from what the WHO is suggesting. But now the interesting point to me is that the WHO has, has not in its guideline included an online ban. They've suggested the prohibition of sale of e-cigarettes in venues where cigarette 
selling is is prohibited. But now, is the internet a venue? I I, I don't think one would uh, interpret it, it legally as as a venue. It's a it's a channel or a, or a mechanism. So, looking at that, you know, our government has probably gone above and beyond what the World Health Organization guidelines recommend, which is fine. The World Health Organization, particularly with regards to tobacco regulation, has said that its FCTC regulations are just a baseline and countries are welcome to and in fact encouraged to go beyond the WHO guidelines. Uh, so in terms of WHO policy, uh, you know, our government could certainly answer that there's every call from the WHO to supersede the the guidelines that they've that they've recommended but to me it's a problem this is you know we've got to look beyond WHO guidelines and just looking at it globally yes there is concern about minors being able to access age restricted products online and this this transcends vaping and it transcends South Africa. I mean, the European Union, the United States, a lot of countries are really worried about kids getting hold of knives, pornography, age-restricted computer games, alcohol, you name it. Anything that's available online that's an age-restricted product is causing big problems for, for regulators because it's a loophole that allows, allows kids to skirt the law. Now, with that said and done, there, there are two issues here that are, are pertinent to me. The first is the issue of a level playing field. Um, in public, the WHO will tell you that they don't recommend e-cigarettes, uh, that they want to see them regulated, etc., etc. In private, they are probably quite supportive of, of e-cigarettes. I mean, they've read the science, they know the science. Their public stance is predicated on a deep dislike and distrust of the tobacco industry. And because the tobacco industry is involved in vaping, the WHO feels that it must put forward a public stance of opposing big tobacco. But I'm sure that if you had to speak to them in private, they would be supportive of vaping as a gateway out of smoking. Now, where the level playing field comes in is that Big Tobacco has had a century to establish a bricks and mortar presence. And that is basically what this online ban achieves. It's to restrict the sale of tobacco products, including vaping, if it's regulated as a tobacco product. And putting that entirely into the face-to-face -face bricks and mortar space. So in other words, they're saying that the vendor is able to ensure uh, age verification because it's a face-to-face -face transaction. Vendors can uh, prevent kids from buying. And that will doubtless be their argument that it's, it's the safeguard against minors accessing age-restricted products. But now we, we come to a point where it's working against vaping's aims and society's aims of giving smokers free access to an alternative and reduced harm product. There is no way that vaping can compete with big tobacco given big tobacco's foothold in the bricks and mortar space. And this, this now goes further because um, we've seen in the UK a lot of comment around the upsurge in uh, vaping retail stores in high streets. But the problem is that high street specialist stores are something of an anachronism. You know, commerce is increasingly shifting online and it's increasingly shifting to multi-purpose stores like supermarkets and chains where people are able to get a lot of products at one time. Now, if we, if we translate that to South African market, I have three vape kings within probably five, six kilometers of my house. So I can 
theoretically, I can pop into any one of them. The problem is that those stores only sell vaping products. I can get tobacco products from supermarkets, from bottle stores, from filling station uh, convenience stores, where I'm getting other consumer products as well. So I can go and pick up my bread and milk from my neighborhood spa and I can pick up cigarettes at the same time. If I want to buy vaping gear, I've got to make a dedicated trip to a vaping store. And that's for me in a, in a major urban area. Now you look at the people in the outlying uh, rural areas, you know, in these little towns that don't actually have a vaping store. If you cut online sales, there is, there is no viable opposition to, to the tobacco industry's grip on the bricks and mortar sector. So that is a problem for me. It's, it's working against public health aims. There, there are several of these regulations that I, I can't, you know, even though I don't want them, I can't disagree much in principle with them. But this is one where I can disagree wholly with the, with the whole principle behind it. So what you're saying is um, that, you know, yes, age verification is a problem, you know, um, but it's not got a lot to do with that. What it's got to do with is, you know, because of the distrust in the tobacco industry, um, they want to, you know, cut um, pretty much vaping and or any tobacco related product with the same knife. And by doing that, vaping is the small brother that gets bullied, you know? So, yeah, the problem is that, you know, obviously uh, cigarettes are banned online as well. And this flows from that because mm -hmm. it's, it's the logical extension. If the WHO recommend that, that cigarette sales be banned online and the WHO recommend that vaping products be uh, regulated as tobacco products, then it becomes a logical extension. If cigarettes are banned online, you also ban vaping online. Mm. But where that where that falls down is it doesn't it doesn't take into account the broader uh, the broader realities of the situation, which is that vaping is split. Big tobacco owns a part of it. The vaping industry owns owns a part of it. Big tobacco has that retail space that distribution network set up. They've, they've had a century yep. to set it up. Mm. Where they are, they are in filling stations, they're in bottle stores, they're in supermarkets. supermarkets vaping, yeah. Yeah, vaping hasn't had that chance. Now, what is going to happen? Industry projections are that within 10 years or so, vaping sales may exceed cigarette sales. So you, you're going to have, you know, more or less equal market. That, that might be an optimistic uh, projection. I don't know. But let, let's say within 15 years that vaping matches uh, cigarette sales in retail terms. What that must lead to, if you have a bricks and mortar uh, environment where, where sales must be verified by face-to-face by -face sales, you're going to have vaping having to compete with cigarettes in those bricks and mortar outlets, mm. being, being supermarkets, uh, bottle stores, uh, garage, you know, uh, filling station convenience stores. Vaping can't compete. Big Tobacco owns that space. They, yeah. are, they are never going to allow vaping products to sit side by side on spa or pick and pay shelf space with Big Tobacco products. Now, regulators may argue it's not our job to determine market share, but I, th I think they do have a job to determine, particularly flowing from WHO's distrust of big tobacco, that big tobacco doesn't take this market over. Yeah, so, you know, say, say for instance, this uh, regulation, this point is passed, you know, um, and it becomes law. The, the impact, of course, is going to be um, that, you know, either vaping needs to expand to all these other stores and compete, um, you know, with the tobacco products in that way. Um, but, you know, also what could happen, it could mean that we'll get more vaping stores, you know, in neighborhoods um, and around. So you, you might see, 
more stores popping up um, where people can go and buy store, um, buy uh, juice and, and whatever. Um, but, you know, interestingly enough, we, um, we've been talking about juice and we've been talking about nicotine. Um, you know, it's not just that. It's actually any nicotine delivery system any nicotine delivery, delivery system. So, you know, um, you can't just from your website take off the juice because that's got the nicotine in and still show um, your hardware. Everything vaping related needs to be verified by age so or needs to be a sale done face to face. So that's a, a pretty big impact. Um, I think there's... The, I, I, I don't know what the statistics are, but I do know of a lot of uh, people who only have online stores. And immediately when this pass, this bill passes, those all those stores will have to sl shut down. You know. I also thought about um, another thing as well. Um, so we banning safe if this law, uh, if this gets passed as law. Um, does that mean if we import um, juice from another country, um, are we able to do that? Not as far as I know. Mm. The interesting thing about the laws is that it, it's not only pitched at retail level, it's pitched at customer level. If you read the, the wording of the law, it says you are not allowed to buy. Mm. It says you can't sell or redistribute, etc., etc. But then the last verb is buy. So it applies at, at a customer level. At a customer well. level, wow. Yeah, this is, this is not just uh, regulation for the industry, it's regulation for the customers as well. So, yeah, it's a, it's a problem. I mean, if they're trying to force the industry into the face-to-face -face retail space, vaping is not going to compete with big tobacco. Even if vaping gets, you know, what the UK calls a high street presence, which would be specialized vaping shops like your Vape Kings, Vape Rights, you know, the, the, the stores that currently sell vaping gear, they're still at a massive disadvantage because it puts on vaping vendors the, the stresses and the pressures of rental and overheads and finding premises and so on. Big Tobacco has completely eliminated that. Hmm. The specialist tobacconist store is basically dead. I mean, cigarettes, you know, they're marketed through general stores that sell other other products. So it's other industries that are paying those those overheads and, and that rent. I mean, in supermarkets, it's, it's the food industry. In bottle stores, it's the liquor industry. And in garages, it's the petrol industry. So the tobacco industry doesn't have these rental overheads, you know, vendors related to the tobacco industry. They're taking up space within other industries, uh, retail space. If vaping has to provide its own retail space, pay its own rental, its own overheads, its own staff, it's gonna be very difficult for them to compete. Mm -hmm. And then if, if we look further than that, and, and this I think is, is also a very pertinent point. You know, banning online sales on the basis of, of age restriction is anti-progressive. E-commerce is here to stay. Trying to dictate that it can be an adults only thing is also anti-progressive. I mean, I see a time in the very near future, if it isn't happening already, where a kid at school will, 20 minutes before their lunch break, they'll tap their cell phone. When they go out for their lunch break into the playground, there'll be a delivery vehicle with their lunch waiting at the school gate where they pick it up, you know, which is being summoned by that, that cell phone service. Uh, yeah. Ser service, mm. 20 minutes before they finish school in the afternoon, they'll tap their cell phone again. When they come out, there'll be an Uber mm. waiting, waiting for them to take them home. I mean, kids are, are, you know, they need to buy as well. They need to transact online as well. Mm. So to try and keep them out of that space for me is anti-progressive. Instead, we should be embracing the concept that, that kids will be going online and we should be sorting out mechanisms and systems whereby stop that age, right yeah well whereby, whereby age verification is is doable online but this already exists um 
you know, I know if if they do a verification, uh, identity verification, which is pretty much an age verification. Um, if if I um, order a new bank card, or if my credit card expires, and I need a new one, then um, you know I go online, I order it, and then it's it's not the bank that comes out. It's um, it's a postal delivery service that comes out and they, they've been given the information um, about who made the purchase and then they do a verification on your ID to make sure and also the picture on the ID to make sure that, you know, you, you are the right person to give this card to. So, of course, that's a little bit more expensive, but, you know, if, if that's what... And, and I don't think this is a bad thing at all. You know, if, if, if it becomes law that we need to make, you know, in our, in our postal service for any vaping related products, there needs to be age verification by the postal service and a proof needs to be given like a sign off or whatever. Then, um, you know, then this doesn't make sense because it just seems like, in, in this specific um, point, you know, in the bill, it feels like they want to cut vaping with exactly the same knife as they, they, they cutting um, tobacco. And, you know, like you said, if they do that, then, you know, vaping is going to suffer quite a bit because it doesn't have the distribution channel that big tobacco has already set up. Um, so, you know, the growth um, from people switching from tobacco to vaping, it's going to be a whole lot slower because there's just, you know, it's just going to be um, inconvenient for you to, to try and vape. Yeah, the, I mean, the easiest mechanism for me would be for banks to put an extra stage into online purchasing where it runs a database check against the ID number of the account holder. Uh, so if I buy a vaping product online, I pay with my credit card, the request goes through to the bank. The bank behind the scenes, the merchant doesn't need to know anything. They don't need to know, you know my credit record or they don't even need to know my ID number. All that happens is that you run a database check as an extra step in that uh, purchase verification procedure where it checks your age against the ID number that the bank must have due, due to FICA, FICA verification of, of all our financial institutions. And if, it, if that ID number check returns that you're under 18 years old, it just stops the transaction. Boom. Merchant gets, gets a, a message saying that the the transaction is, uh, was unable to be completed. Of course, if you pass, the transaction goes through. But now the problem is I've discussed that briefly with a vendor who said the banks are not willing to do that, which they may have a point. It might result in a lot of processing overload uh, mm. you know, on bank systems because it's an extra step that goes into, into online purchasing. Perhaps the banks feel that they don't need to to do it the solution lies elsewhere perhaps the banks don't want to be associated anything to do with any industry that big tobacco is involved in i don't know what the, the exact um rationale is for the banks not being keen to, to get involved but for whatever reason apparently they're not and we've seen this as well you know with this whole uh, uh mastercard and visa thing last year where uh, you know, vaping online purchases were suddenly, you know, there were problems with, with payment processes and, and so on, because it is a high risk, it's a high risk industry. Hmm. So there is limited goodwill and limited willingness among people who aren't involved in the industry to actually go the extra mile on behalf of vapors. But the, I mean, there are many other, other you, know, you know, we could also look at couriers. Hmm. Yes, uh, do, doing age verification, but are the couriers now going to be well, uh, willing to do that? Do they yeah. want their drivers to spend that extra time checking your ID book? Or yeah, it already happens, you know, um, in the banking industry with cards, like I mentioned. Um, but 
you know, this, this is not something that's going to go away. So um, that first verification step, you know, if it's a flagged product, so if it's alcohol, cigarettes, um, you know, vaping juice or whatever, if it's a flagged product or pornography for that matter, um, whatever, if it's a flagged product, then, you know, there should be an auto check. If you can actually with, you know, whoever is registered with um, on that card, if they can actually make that pur uh, purchase, you know, that would be a good and, and not a very complex thing to do um, with the FICA regulation here. Um, so I don't think, you know, but that would be, a, that would just be an initial check. Um, but I think that the, the true check would then be face to face. You know, if the career service checks that the card and the person that belongs to that card is actually the person who's taking that product out of the courier's hand. You know, all these services exist already. So it's really strange for me that, um, you know, that that wasn't put in here that, you know, instead what we have is just cut online sales, you know, entirely. It just, for me, that just, like you said, it's 100% anti-progressive because, um, you know, if, if it's my choice to vape or to, you know, buy alcohol or to buy cigarettes, that's, you know, that's my choice. I'm already paying, you know, taxes on some of those products. Um, so I, you know, I should be able to, to get them, you know, and conveniently because I'm a consumer. Um, so, you know, I think it's anti-progressive for everything, you know, for vaping, for alcohol, for, um, you know, cigarettes, I think it's anti-progressive for everything because, um, you know, you, you're just inconvening us. But if somebody is an addict, if somebody is addicted to something, they are going to find a means to go to a shop and get it, right? So all this is going to be, if this, if this um, bill passes, it just means um, I will have to make more regular, um, more regular uh, turns at my local vape store right? And uh, I'll be faced with whatever they've got available or I'll be, my options will be limited to whatever they have available. At the moment, you, you know, if I want something, I go through the entire internet in South Africa. I see where the product is the cheapest and where, you know, there's on the same store, there's other items that I want to buy and I make a purchase and I, it conveniently gets delivered. So if, if that gets taken away, you know, I think it'll be a big blow for vaping. Um, I think that's what really contributed to the success. Um, the service delivery that we're getting nowadays, you know, in vaping uh, from the stores is just unfounded. It's, uh, you know, you place an order in the morning at eight o'clock and the same day, you know, you will get your stuff, which is for me, that's progressive. And, and that's where we need to be. So, um, this is this is just backwards, you know. Um, it, it's going to be a big one. There's going to be many losses here. Um, the other thing I thought about as well is how would we navigate this? So, so if it did pass, you know, what are some of the strategies that uh, some of the stores that still want to transact? What what can they do? Can they still have their products online, but not not um, on sale that's a very difficult one because it's an easy one to regulate you know if, if you're visible to the public you're visible to regulators and some countries in the eu have actually um implemented this i, I believe austria and poland have both uh banned online sales and then i think it was belgium is also not allowed online i was at a belgian site earlier and it's the most bizarre thing. I mean, they've got everything up there, all, all the categories, you know, mods, tanks, drippers, etc. And you click on everything, it's just a blank page. There's nothing on the site. So there, there are, are also mechanisms that can be suggested um, at a pitch at a government level, at a regulatory level to get around this. One of them is the use of third party service providers who access things like the electoral roll 
to determine the age of, of people. Now, these that again is a market niche where I imagine a company could make a lot of money by hiring their services to online retailers and you know offering the service. You don't need to worry about age restriction. We will verify it. Come via our third-party site. We will do the verification for you and we will give you a yay or nay. So there's that option. Some American retailers have used the, uh, the selfie craze to do it. What you have to do, if you want to buy from them, you have to show your driver's license or some other form of ID and you have to hold it up and take a, take a selfie. And then you mail the selfie to them or you WhatsApp the selfie to them. And they actually have face recognition software running on their servers that will look at the photo of your your driver's license or whatever, compare it to your face in the selfie and will give them a positive match whether the, whether the face ID actually, actually works or not. So, there, I mean, there are multiple tech, technological solutions to this. And to throw the whole thing out, to throw out the baby with the bathwater is, mm. it's just anti-progressive. It's, you know, it's taking us back to pre-internet times and pre-digital information age times where everything is high street, you know, bricks and mortar retail sales. It's just, mm. it's pushing, pushing us back in time and holding us back from competing with other countries in, you know, online sales. As you say, our, our vaping vendors have set unprecedented levels of service. Mm. I mean, Americans don't believe me when I tell them how quick I can get my flavors and my, and my bases and, and Nick, you know, I tell them it's six hours. If I order before 10 in the morning, I have the stuff early afternoon. Even some of the biggest um, retailers in the US, it's three weeks for them to ship the stuff out. You know, and Americans just cannot believe that here in Africa we get stuff same day. So it's an area in which we are extremely competitive. To throw that out, and to ban the entire thing is, you know, it's a big, big step backwards. Backwards. Yeah, because, uh, um, you know, uh, so let's look at who will be affected. You know, if you sell juice, so, you know, if you're a, a shop that has an online presence and sell juice online, the juice line, all of the juice will be affected. Of course, the person who produces the juice, he'll be indirectly affected. <clears throat> Um, because, you know, there might not be as many sales because of the inconvenience, right? So sales will go down. That's not just for juice. Excuse me, guys. <coughs> then, um, you know, for any hardware as well, um, exactly the same thing. So you can't sell it online, but you can buy it in the shop. All right. Um, then if we look at the DIY industry, um, Flavors is, I mean, those are, are bakeries and I mean, you know, those aren't specifically made for vaping. So I think flavors will be fine here. <clears throat> You'll still be able to buy them online. You'll still be able to buy your, um, your bases online. That wouldn't be a problem. Um, I think nicotine could be a problem, you know, so you might need to every now and then go to a, a brick and mortar store just to get yourself a, a bottle of uh, 36 or 48 milligram nicotine and that lasts you for a month or two, you know, so the DIY industry here won't be, um, it won't have that much of an impact. So it might shift a lot of people to DIY. Um, I can see, see that happening um, because it might just be too difficult to go outside and, and buy stuff from brick and mortar stores. People might just mix up their own stuff at home now. So I definitely don't see DIY um, as, as being a, a major impact, but it will be a big impact for um, uh, brick and mortar stores and also juice manufacturers. Well, there's ancillary services too. I mean, if you look mm. at, if you look at the business, the, the couriers get out of vaping, it's significant. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder what they, because um, I mean, it, they have to be happy with the business that vaping is providing for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know if they're happy enough to go the extra mile of 
of undertaking the you know the admin of, of checking um, IDs, but they've certainly got to be happy with the amount of custom they're getting from Vaping. Yeah, because, um, you know, as somebody spoke to, I spoke to a couple of people about this. Um, now, they, you know, this is how it reads. It reads, <clears throat> um, supply or distribute or buy a relevant production through the postal services or any other electronic or by any other remote means. So, you can't, um, if this bill pass, passes, you can't phone the vape store and say, what products do you have available? Find out, you know, make a selection over the telephone and then the person posting that to you because that will all be illegal. Mm. You'll have, it has to be face to face then. You know what I mean? So you have to go to a store. So you can't phone in an order. You can phone in an order and they keep it for you until you go and collect it. But, you know, there's no way a courier can pick it up and fetch it. So what if, um, I thought about another thing. Um, what if I ask a postal service to go and collect a package for me? So instead of um, it being a subsidiary service of vaping, right? So if you go and you buy your stuff online um, and you have your package, then you know what, what happens now is the courier service gets notified um, and they come and collect the package and drop it off. What if I, as the consumer, ask um, the courier company to go and collect something for me? Because then um, it's a collection and it's not like I'm buying something online. Is, is that a way to navigate this? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a long way around to what we suggested earlier of the courier companies doing age verification. I mean, yeah. The only difference now is that you are contacting the courier company instead of the vaping vendor, mm. uh, hiring the, the the courier company. So I, I don't know if that would if that would work. Um, what they've done in in the EU countries that have have banned online sales, they do allow store collection. So even though in Poland you're not allowed to buy stuff and have it delivered you can at least order it online and then you can go there the next day and pick it up which is rather pointless i mean if you're going to go there you might as well buy it when you when you're there so you know it doesn't and the thing is again it's fine for you and me we live in in gauteng where we you know we have dozens of stores within relatively easy driving distance what happens to the people who live in umkamas or ladysmith or yeah, just know, a little bit out you know what i mean like you know, mm. or, yeah. you know, something just a little bit out, like an hour out of mm. the city. Then it becomes, <laughs> you know, like an hour out and there's, you know, there's convenience stores and there's places where you can buy alcohol and there's supermarkets. There's nothing else there, you know? So, yeah, for hardware, it, it's not that big a problem because you could probably say, okay, if it's only hardware, you know, you don't need to buy tanks and mods every week. You can, you know, maybe buy a tank and mod once a year, uh, you know, on your on a trip to Joburg or ask someone to get it for you. But juice is a, you know, it's a daily con consumable. I mean, I would imagine people who are buying juice are buying probably a couple of times a month. And, you know, how somebody is going to source juice in some tiny little place in the Karoo that doesn't have a vape shop is going to be... Look, I mean, there, there are ways around it, uh, you know, even though the, the government prohibition extends to buying, they're, they're not going to stop people, you know, if I have a mate in the Karoo who wants a juice, there's nothing to stop him making an EFT to my, my account as a birthday present and me buying juice and couriering it to him for his birthday present and we just have birthdays twice a month each you know i mean <laughs> but do do we want to go you know should we be forced to go that route? i mean when there's a will there's a way sure you know it's it's almost like like you said this is um it's not progressive at all and the only thing that's gonna happen here is uh, with this specific point in the bill is people are going to look at 
al alternate um, ways to navigate this, right? So I don't know if this is going to have the impact that they want. If the impact that they want here is to verify age, their services, which will help us do that. So, you know, this specific point should read very differently. Um, and, you know, but if, if, the, if the aim here is to cut us with the same knife as, as what tobacco is being cut with at the moment, then, you know, the vaping industry, like you said, Richard, the vaping industry is going to, it's going to get the biggest blow here by far. Um, and, you know, it will be very unfair for the vaping community. It's not a setback for tobacco at all. No. The, I mean, what sets back tobacco here? Because that's what already is happening. You cannot buy um, tobacco really online. Um, well, I haven't looked, to be honest, because it's just so convenient. No, um, you, you, could, you can't, but you don't need to because they, they've... Tobacco is the most easily available and most efficiently distributed product in the world. Yeah. The only thing that comes close possibly is Coca-Cola. <laughs> but if, if you think wherever you are in South Africa, there's a tobacco outlet. You can live in the smallest one, one horse town in the Karoo. There'll be a filling station and that filling station will have a shop that sells cigarettes. cigarettes. There'll be a spa and that spa mm. will sell cigarettes. There'll probably be a bottle store and that bottle store will sell cigarettes. cigarettes there's, yeah. no, there's no settlement in South Africa. I doubt there's even a farming village that's supplied only by a farming general store that, that can't get tobacco. Mm. So there, there's no call for online sales because it is the most widely available product in the, on the entire planet. I mean, if, if I want nicotine at three o'clock in the morning, I'm never going to find it from a vape shop. I can find tobacco, tobacco everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I, can, I can walk to the nearest garage. I've got a 24-hour garage less than a kilometer away from me. Even if my car breaks down, I can walk there at three in the morning and buy cigarettes. Yeah. So there's absolutely no call to have cigarettes online. Mm. Um, so obviously, it, it's, it plays right into you know, the tobacco industry's advantage Favor. because they, yeah, they, they've got the shelf space at at the supermarkets, they've got the shelf space at the bottle stores, they own the shelf space at the filling stations. Mm. So their mods, their juices, their tanks, their coils will fill that space and it would be very easy for them to, you know, deny that space to vaping because they, they have the established relationships with the vendors and, and with the chains and they, they can keep them out. So, you know, again, government may say it's not our job to regulate market share or to determine market share. It's a, it's a free market. It has to be decided on market factors. You know, but they're dealing vaping a gut punch hmm. and they know it. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I've seen in the recent maybe year and a half, I've seen a great push for, um, you know, twisp, twisp hardware and twisp juice into um, convenience stores, specifically convenience stores, not so much supermarkets, even though I've, I've started seeing it now in, in supermarkets as well. Um, but specifically, you know, so um, heat not burn devices and um, TWISP, I'm almost seeing now in every convenience store. So, you know, if we're going to talk about vaping, who's going to be affected? It's, it's going to be, um, you know, the guys that don't have that distribution channel, right? It's going to be the guys that, you know, sell their juice only in one shop, for instance. Um, those are going to be the guys that are going to be affected. Vaping, um, you know, in its larger sense, so if you look at like Twisp, they have that distribution channel to some degree set out already. And I think they will grow on that because there'll be a much larger demand for this. So it does, play a little bit in their favor. Um, I'm talking about twist now as well um, because they don't really have an online presence, do they? No. No. I haven't I think seen that, I think that was a deliberate decision on their, on their part. I mean, when I started vaping, I started with a twist. It was bought at a, a pick and pay that was situated at a garage. And I, I think they've, 
they followed that model deliberately because it's you know it's a safe model it's face-to-face -face sales age verification is is possible so they probably anticipated the uh, the online ban and built their business model accordingly uh, but then the other problem that vaping faces and this this is going to result in a shake-up in the industry you know regardless of whether regulation happens or not but the, you know the whole switch towards vaping becoming a mainstream consumer product if you go into pick and pay and you want to buy potato chips how many brands does pick and pay have shelf space for it's going to be willards simba pringles tates pick and pay house brand fritos lays maybe maybe one or two others how many brands of vape juice are there there's five there's five thousand yeah. now which which brand of vape juice do they give preference to in the shelf space and this again is where you know the tobacco industry they're going to have a few giant brands mm. enormous brands of juice that sell millions of bottles to to big tobacco cigar like customers so it becomes very easy for them you know they go they go to retailers and they say we've got eight juices eight different flavors it's a mega brand it sells millions of bottles vaping is going to go to them and say we've got 10,000 different brands none of them sell that much but if you want to appeal you know to the broad spectrum of vapors you're going to have to stock all these different brands of juice so that industry rationalization is must happen anyway at a just at a capitalist um, distribution level because there are no industries where you've got 10,000 tiny providers every product that you buy be it chew polish tinned fish marmalade mayonnaise whatever it is you're going to get five or six mega brands and those yeah. are going to be the brand those are going to be the brands that will be stocked you know at your major retailers juice we don't have that yeah I mean um the way I see it um, is, you know, if, if I compare it to beer, for instance, so I can go into a, a liquor shop and I can buy, you know, Castle, Lion, Black Label, whatever I want there. Those are the, you know, the big names. And, but, you know, as a beer drinker, I don't just want to drink that beer all the time. I want something different. So now, now what you see is um, a lot of bars will be selling craft beer. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, all these weird and wonderful juice um, flavors that we have could become more craft, you know, in the future um, where, you know, something like um, twist or whatever will be the consumer that's in the public face. You know, so it will be something like that if this bill passes, of course. Um, I mean, that's really future thinking, but, um, you know, it will be seen as if you go get yourself an international juice or if you go get yourself something different, it will almost seem like a, a, a craft kind of, you know, um, limited edition thing that you get from a shop, you know, just for uh, every now and then but not your your every day and and craft beers are available you know at, at spa tops and, and other bottle stores the problem is that the, they you know you can't you could only have a very small a selection of craft, yeah. craft beers yeah and they're always going to be dominated i mean in the beer market you know amstel castle uh, heineken vintuk uh, these brands are just going to kill them um so you know, are vaping juice lines going to be willing to be restricted to, to craft kind status? of status? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would think that the big brands uh, would be able to compete and beat, um, you know, the tobacco brands and the, and the mass manufacturer brands. But if if this goes ahead, it's not going to happen. I mean, yeah, no, it will stop it in its tracks for sure. So then, say if this does pass, then um, I'm not sure how many people know this, but 
Uh, any person who contravenes or fails to comply with the section is guilty of an offence and liable on conviction to fine or to imprisonment not exceeding a period of three months or to both a fine and such imprisonment. Um, it talks about here um, no more than a year, depending on, you know, if, if you're uh, if you offended more, more than once, um, but never more than a year, you know. So this is this is serious stuff here that we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about conviction. What you need to do is you need to pull the Sharon Stone stunt. When they take you to the station, you sit there in your sexy outfit and you vape your stuff and they say, you're not allowed to do that here. <laughs> and you tell them, what are you going to do? <laughs> Arrest me for buying Hardwicks online. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can't. It, it, this is just absurd. It's absurd. It's obscene. It, it doesn't make sense to me. You yeah. know, this I, th I, th I think is is a key part of the legislation, and it's it's not a part that's that's been thought through. And I th I think it's the the one aspect that we have a very good chance of overturning just by uh, engaging with government and you know, helping them to understand the situation. And, and that's what I did. I mean, the day after the draft bill was, was published, I mailed the Department of Health with objections and alternatives hmm. for the, you know, for the online ban. Even, look, it's very easy for them to say, it's an age-restricted product, we're allowed to stop it. But the thing is, even if we can get them you know, to not allow it permanently, but to give a window of opportunity, a three-year, five-year window of opportunity that allows vaping to get on a relatively equal footing mm. with the tobacco industry in terms of bricks and mortar presence. What will probably in any case happen in that three to five years is that e-commerce will move forward again and we will get technology uh, which will help to make age verification problems uh, a thing of the past. Mm. The, the other big problem that we have, and this again is global, it transcends South Africa and it transcends vaping, is that the prevailing mood among regulators is that, look, there are three parties. There's the consumer, there's the payment processor, and there's the merchant. The prevailing mood among regulators is that the primary responsibility for avoiding online sales to minors lies with the merchant. Mm. And this is why they say things like putting up, you know, no, no under 18s allowed on your website is not sufficient for them or making you enter your birth date or, or whatever. They, they say it's not sufficient. It serves for them as a kind of disclaimer, because they can at least say, look, the buyer was guilty of an offense, yet they stated that they were over 18, you know, by clicking on the, on the enter bu button, they have misled us and they've also accepted responsibility for defrauding the system as such and, and claiming that they are of legal age. But the problem is that regulators don't buy that. And this has been the big thing in the United States with, you know, Scott Gottlieb and the FDA cracking down on, on vendors that are selling to, to miners. The primary responsibility lies with the vendor. And it's the same in the UK. You know, they're having all these things now about kids buying uh, knives online and age-restricted age games and whatnot. And their regulatory and industry position papers they put out to merchants is it's your responsibility own it and and take acceptance for it you can't blame the customer and you can't blame or you can't put the onus on the on the payment processor so it's a really tough one i mean it's the vendors whose business is being killed and they're the ones who've given the primary responsibility so it's like a double whammy for for them I don't know how they're going to get around that. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is a big one. This is definitely key. 
um, this specific point is, is, is key for me, for the industry. So, you know, if we can win this battle, you know, just on this point here, if we can, you know, sway them to let us uh, form better distribution channels before we put this in place or allow us grace period to find services to help us verify, uh, uh, verify age, that, that will be big wins for us mm. as an industry. Yeah. It still leaves legacy problems that have to be tackled later because, you know, if we have to hire high street premises and the tobacco industry continues to own the retail space that they own, it remains a lopsided battle. Uh, so there's that to be tackled, which which goes above and beyond the um, the online battle. But I, I think this is the regulation which can most easily be overturned and which can most easily be omitted from the bill. From the yeah, well, from the act. Yeah, um, it's in the bill, but it, yeah. but it'll. Okay. Cool. So. Um, is there anything more you want to chat about, Richard, on that, or shall we jump over to the mixer? No, I think that about covers it. It would have been nice if VPA, VPA ASA had been in here because I would imagine that they have done a national economic impact study just in terms of, of the turnover effect, you know, for the economy and then also the jobs effect. It would have been nice to have those figures. I mean, just working on gut feel, I think we can conclude that it, it will have significant hmm. impact. Uh, but it would have been nice to get some, put some figures on it and just uh, get an idea of the context of the, of the problem. But maybe we can ask them about that when they, when they join the, at a later stage. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we'll, um, when they join us, we can potentially go through, um, you know, some of the topics that we've covered, some of the key points um, as a whole, you know, and get some feedback from them on what they've done on those specifics or what their thoughts are around them. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely going to try and schedule